What's going on guys, JPS back for another video, and today we're going to be reacting to four ways British and American houses are very different. This is another video from Lost in the Pond, so make sure you guys go subscribe to his channel. He's lived in both Britain and the United States, so he has a lot of experience to speak on when he's making his videos. One thing I think of when I think of British homes, subcompact, they're much smaller than American homes on average, but that just makes sense because there's not as much space and still got to fit a good amount of people into the country right so yeah there's definitely a lot I need to learn about British houses though and I haven't really been in too many either but they definitely have this distinct feeling like when you're in a British home I feel like you know it but anyways we're gonna get into some of those distinct differences between these uh, American and British houses make sure you guys hit that like button hit subscribe consider joining the patreon first link in description for full reactions to British shows and movies with that being said, let's get right into this. And tea drinkers that we are, we love our kettles, don't we? But they're not just any kettles. These are ones you plug in and then hit the switch to turn on the plug, because I forgot to mention that our plug sockets also have switches. Hello, I'm Lawrence, and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond, and one of those memos pertains to houses, the things we live inside. If if you're watching this video, it's quite likely you're either inside a house right now, or you're near one, because otherwise you wouldn't probably have internet access quite as easily. To anyone that might be new to this channel, come on in, get yourself a cup of tea. I'm, this isn't a genuine offer to come into my house. I'm just <laughs> say, join the channel, this is good. And hello to everybody who's been here a long time. Today we're going to look at several ways in which British and American houses are very, very different. Having lived in the United States for over 11 years, I've lived in my fair share of houses here, just as I did in Britain. So I think I have a decent grasp of how houses work. Even tiny ones like this one, which is about 400 square feet. I'm joking, this is a professional studio. Don't question me. <laughs> and so without further ado, let's take a look at four ways that British and American houses are very, very different. Neither Britain nor America is devoid of variety when it comes to their housing styles. And that's because, well, with each sort of passing phase of history comes new designs to meet new needs and just new style preferences. And because of this variety, I'm not going to cover every single one of them because that would keep us all here until next Wednesday, which would be good for my metrics, but not good for your sanity. <laughs> so let's take a look at how some of the housing styles do vary from country to country. In Britain, a lot of the distinctive styles are also tied up with the period in which they were built. So you could go all the way back to the Tudor period and you do find Tudor housing dotted around here and there. In fact, if you go to the city of York, for example, there's quite a lot of sort of Tudor buildings there. They're quite ornate with wood panelling and they're the sort of place that you might imagine that Shakespeare lived. But wood is less indicative of British houses than you would see in America where wood is actually quite a common material for building houses. In Britain, from about the Georgian period onward, you're going to see quite a lot of brickwork. Uh, Georgian period houses absolutely exist. People live in them, but they tend to be these opulent looking houses that to have notable pops of white rectangle which are just the windows it's very nice it, they look like dolls houses that you should live in but then come the Victorian age we started moving toward these sort of like orangey brick buildings right and a lot of them were terraced houses which is what Americans would call row houses and they just look very industrial right you could imagine a chimney sweep going up and getting his face covered in soot and then we move into the Edwardian period where houses are sort of similar to those of the Victorian age they're just lighter colors with more chimney sweeps if Mary Poppins is anything to go by. Now during World War II when the Nazis bombed the ever-loving crap out of us a lot of the houses went boom and then after World War II there was a housing boom and you started to see a build-up of new more simple houses kind of like the one I grew up in. Now that that's a castle <laughs> that didn't happen um, but I did I grew up in something more like this that's not Lawrence's actual house. Despite what fairy tales may suggest, most of us have never lived in a chocolate box house, but those do exist. A chocolate box house is the kind of house you might see in the Cotswolds, right? It's very quaint looking, it's got thatch roofing, and it looks like this. And if, like me, you're wondering why it's called a chocolate box house, yet it doesn't look edible, it goes back to the 1950s slash 60s when chocolate boxes would have on their facade a kind of depiction of a beautiful English countryside. And these types of houses would often feature on said box now again this is by no means an entire all the houses in the Cotswolds are beautiful they have those honeycomb walls or outside whatever it is they just have a very distinct look to them but I didn't expect him to go into this level of depth breaking down different ages and how those affected the style of houses um, 
the house that he showed that he grew up in though that's what i think of when i think of a british home more modern i guess that's what i've been seeing more of in uh some of the shows i watch and things like that entire repository of british houses um, neither is the following an entire repository of american houses it's just the the more common ones that you will see when you are here so cape cod houses you know these types of houses right they're the ones with the wood paneling down the side and i said a moment ago that you know america makes good use of wood in this country because there's just so much of it so many uh, woodlands around the country and it's a huge country from which to pull that resource so they do and it's cheap but funnily enough the cape cod style has its history with english settlers who came here in the 17th century and started building Cape Cod style houses in New England. Now during the post-World War II period, partly to provide you know housing to veterans coming back from war, there was a revival of Cape Cod style housing and it started to be built not just in New England but all along the East Coast and in the Midwest and even out West. Anybody that's seen the Goonies will know that. And it was this style of housing that I first moved into when I moved to the United States. And I've got to say, even despite the Midwest winters, it was really warm. You know, you'd think it would be quite drafty because of all the the gaps in the wood. You could go to specific streets or neighborhoods or areas of the United States and only find these houses for miles and miles. So I lived in one of those, but my grandparents-in-law lived in what is known as a ranch style house. And these are sort of really low down buildings, don't typically have two floors to them. And once- Speaking of ranch, I'm sorry, my mom grew up in Texas. This, this brought up back some memories, but he's right. They don't really have levels like that. Like a lot of the houses, uh, where my mom grew up in Texas will only be one floor, which is just so crazy because, you know, a lot of the houses around here, I'd say two, three, I don't even know. Sometimes they have an attic that counts as a fourth floor. But the reason for the lack of levels would be, well, the weather. If something blows through, like a tornado or whatever the case may be, because that's the thing. It's su such open area, such open land. And if a front comes through, there's really not much to stop it. Like on the East Coast, we have, you know, some mountains, like the Appalachian Mountains and other stuff. And also our weather isn't like that. We don't have tornadoes like that. That's a Texas thing. So if you have a, a house with three levels and a tornado comes through, probably not going to work out too well for you. That's why they have the basement to retreat into and sometimes little shelters as well. Crazy stuff. Once again, these houses became popular after World War II. There was just generally a big sort of boom after World War II. Look at that. <laughs> in the United States um, in that regard. Uh, the 20th century, though, did see more and more revivalism of old styles. So you had, you know, mock Tudor, or shall I say revival Tudor, um, which more or less replicated the kind of Tudor buildings that you would see in England with some differences. And I've seen those types of buildings in Boston, for example. I've also seen them in Indiana. As well as that, the 20th century saw colonial revivalism, though most people won't, don't live in those houses. Maybe one day when I get that grand piano, I'll, I'll think about it. And so that's an extremely basic and rudimentary breakdown of some of the different styles that you'll see in each country. But there's one big, big difference between all of the houses in both countries, and it's this. Let's face it, it's time to face up to some home truths. Compared to America, Britain is microscopic. The United States is absolutely massive and needs to be stopped. And the same is true of each country's average house size. Right, so in the United States, houses just tend to be way more spacious. And we're not, we're not just talking about millionaire houses here. We're talking about your average house. So the average size of an American single family home is approximately 1,600 square feet. In the UK, we're looking at an average of about 900 square feet. So why the difference? Well, one reason is population density. In Britain, we're just, we're all a bit packed together. Actually, that partially accounts for why everything is smaller in Britain. Not everything, <laughs> not the cops. But in America, there's just so much land and relative to that land, so few people. So, you know, make them as large as you want. And they do, they're huge. But also a large majority of American houses are relatively new, meaning that they were able to benefit from, you know, building methods and materials that other countries like Britain were not. And the post-war expansion of American highways meant that this was enhanced even more. Those materials could be moved around the country more easily. And of course, this ushered in a more grand housing development. Now, all size aside, try saying that after 10 tepid tequilas. Things become subtly different once you're inside the houses of either country. The Is gadgets. gadgets the right word? I don't know, I'll have to fire my graphics team. Either way, we're essentially <laughs> talking about accessories, the things you have in your house that make that house work, even when you're doing the house 
work. So for example, airflow, right? America's bigger on its overhead fans and air conditioning units. We don't we don't usually use those. I mean, we like to punish ourselves, especially in the summer. But we can crack a window open and it doesn't get oppressively hot always. And so we've moved Okay, thank you. I'm glad he threw in the always part cuz I was going to have some disagreements with that. Um so I was in the UK like two summers ago for there was a big heat wave during the summer. Like it shut the trains down. All types of stuff. And that's when I learned about this lack of air conditioning in Britain. Now, of course, it makes sense. I get it. Like, I'm not against that. But that was quite the introduction into that. Like, that was one of the first things I learned because, well, it's what, 98 degrees Fahrenheit outside? And there's no air conditioning? Like, that, it does really suck when there's a heat wave or something. But thankfully, that doesn't happen too often. And I will say the weather does tend to be much cooler in Britain compared to the United States, especially compared to certain regions of the United States. I mean, if you go southwest, go to Arizona during the summer, or not even during the summer, any time. <laughs> it's too damn hot over there. I don't know how people do it. Like, you step outside and you're immediately covered in sweat because it's, what, 110 degrees sometimes? Like, that's that's inhospitable to someone like me. But some people got it, I guess. Good for them. But it, it makes sense. I, I get it. And also during the year, aside from the summer and these heat waves, these rare heat waves, AC really is not necessary in Britain. Really. The rain every moment cools everything off, so it's not a big deal. You guys get rain five times a day. <laughs> the summer. But we can crack a window open and it doesn't get oppressively hot. Always. And so we've mostly been fine with this situation. It does mean that insects get in. So daddy long legs will get in the house and mosquitoes, but it's a small price to pay for not having air conditioning. I actually quite like air conditioning now that I've lived in the US. Speaking of insects, you also don't see in Britain yeah. those insect screens that you put in the windows, hence why they're getting in. In America, they're virtually in every house, but then again, you know, in Britain, we don't have black widows or brown recluses or the types of mosquitoes that make your face go like this. So I can see why it's justified. I mean, you still get ants, or is that just me? Not sure how they get in, maybe cracks in the wall or maybe through the plug sockets. The plug sockets, of course, are different in both countries too. In Britain, you have the three pronged outlets and in America you sometimes have three but occasionally two and they're smaller in America than they are in Britain that's one of the few things about which you can say that. Uh, separate taps of course for hot and cold water, Americans combine them all into one. Where's the logic in that? I'm joking. And while we're on the yeah. subject of sinks, um, most British sinks don't have that sort of food waste disposal thing that you press the button and it does the noise. Amazing. That was one of the best things I discovered after me I didn't discover it, somebody else came up with the idea and I just used it but it's amazing. It's just so pleasing to know that all of that gunk gets broken down and just don't put your hamster in there. That's, I've learned that lesson. Yeah. From someone else, I didn't do it, just read about it on Reddit. Letterboxes, firstly Americans don't call them letterboxes, but mailboxes and typically don't have them on the door, but outside in the garden, yard. The garden slash yard is different. Often smaller in Britain, but very well kept up, depending on the family. And just massive yards here with, you know, mesh fences and things like that, or picket fences. Uh, back inside, a lot of properties in the United States will have walk-in closets that are built into the speaking of uh, Britain I do really like the the back garden thing I think that's a really common thing throughout uh, Britain and their houses is in the backyard they'll have a little garden area some plants a place to sit place to relax and that's something I really like like that's super nice to be surrounded by all that green and to have that in the United States not as common you know there's definitely people with gardens but it's not like as widespread or uniform as i feel like it is in britain and also yards can be a bit hit or miss too like there's a lot of people with really large front or backyards and i feel like they're not utilized to their full potential but maybe that's just me uh, back inside, a lot of properties in the United States will have walk-in closets that are built into the actual walls of the house. Whereas in Britain, you bring your own closet slash wardrobe to put your clothes in. And that, that takes up more space, I've just realized. So we're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot every step of the way. Except when it comes to washing machines and dryers. How cool mm. is this? We combine them both into one giant cube. Whereas America has two separate cubes. And tea drinkers that we are, we love our kettles, don't we? But they're not just any kettles, these are ones you plug in and then hit the switch to turn on the plug because I forgot to mention that our plug sockets also have switches. And then, you know, you turn it on. That's pretty crazy. Stove top, and it heats up. 
Just like that, you've got your water, Bob's your uncle, pour it into a mug, there's your cup of tea. In America, you do have the stovetop kettles, and part of me likes that because it, it does this really pleasing whistling sound at the end. Now, if you were paying attention during that list, you may have noticed... No, we, if you're a real tea drinker, you don't do stovetop. I got an electric kettle. But I'm not really a real tea drinker. I have it every now and then. That I touched on some of the terminological differences when it comes to housing in either country. And that brings us on to our final entry. It wouldn't be Britain and America if they weren't two countries separated by a common language, and the same is true of the housing world. So let's finish with a rapid fire round looking at those very words. So here in Chicago, I live in a flat, except in America, they don't call it flat, it's called an apartment. Something else that you'll find in America though are these condominiums or condos, if you don't fancy saying a word that has condom in it. And we do have those in Britain, they're just, they're usually called common hold properties. And I suppose most British people wouldn't go around using that term, whereas you actually hear the term condo quite a lot. It's been suggested to me that I move into a condo and it sounds good. I mean, when I first heard the term, I thought I was, it sounded like I might be moving onto a, a lakeside boat or something like that. <laughs> it is like an apartment, but it's one you would buy. It's real estate. Now, as a child and young adult, I grew up in a house that was known as a semi-detached house. That's when you have a house adjoined to one other house on one side, but not on the other side. In the United States, this is known quite simply as a duplex, which is not a wrestling move. If it is adjoined on both sides with another house, then you are part of a line of houses that are known as terraced houses in Britain. In America, they're known as row houses because they're all in a row, presumably. Then there's council housing in Britain versus the project. I think row homes are super popular in like East Coast cities. I know Washington DC has a good amount of row homes. I know Baltimore has row homes. That's specifically in my state, but like the row homes, they, they, you can tell they have some history to them. Like I see some of them in DC, they look pretty old, honestly. And it's a more affordable way than just having your own fully detached house. But it doesn't matter, affordability goes out the window if you're in DC. Uh, I think you guys already know, rent prices are just like, they're always crazy, but it just feels like extra crazy now. I don't know what it is. And I know that's going on in London because literally the last video we reacted to was about a guy living in a skip because of rent prices so it's gotten crazy that's for sure they're all in a row presumably then there's council housing in britain versus the projects in the united states and that's just another way of saying public housing to control the electricity flow in britain you have the mains power in america you have the grid power and what if you're sick and tired of the place that you're living in and you just want to relocate somewhere else in america you would just simply move in britain you'd move house and on that note, I'm gonna move out to my outro transition because this is the end of the video. Let me know in the comments below if you- I'm gonna cut it there. I really like this video. Um, I think Alan, I believe, I keep, I don't know how I've gotten his name wrong in the past if I have, but he has some really good insights from living in both places. And also he just has that, that British sarcasm, that wit, that humor that I love to hear. So honestly could watch any video of his and, would enjoy it so i hope hopefully you guys enjoyed this um american houses I, th I think commenting about on my point earlier again i think it does make sense that american homes go a bit more unutilized compared to british homes because well what 1600 square feet average versus 900 square feet average that's almost half so if you have that little space you're gonna need to be more efficient with how you use it and everything has more of a function whereas in the united states it feels like there's rooms and houses that barely ever get used or there's just you know a lot of stuff that doesn't reach its full potential in terms of use or what it really could be and that makes sense we just have so much extra space like it's, some of these houses being built are just nothing short of ridiculous like you'll never need that many rooms but it's all about that money guys i guess Anyways, hopefully you enjoyed this. If you did, hit that like button, hit subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.